Welcome to the Bare Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from to love, honor, and vacuum.com, where we like to talk about healthy, biblical, and evidence-based advice for your sex life and your marriage. And I am joined today by our researcher, Joanna Swatsky. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. She is our co-author on The Great Sex Rescue, and she is in the middle of moving from the Arctic to Alberta. So she dropped off at our house for a week, descended on us, and we thought we would take advantage of that. And because mm-hmm. your your internet was bad in the Arctic, and it was hard to get you on the it program. It was very terrible. It was <laughs> exactly how you would expect internet to be in the Arctic. <laughs> yeah. And that's my daughter's voice, too. Rebecca Greg- Rebecca. Gre- I said Rebecca Gregoire. You haven't been Rebecca Gregoire for seven years. Nope. Okay, Rebecca Lindenbach. <laughs> our other co-author for The Great Sex Rescue. And the three of us are together. And so we thought that we would film and record a bunch of podcast segments where we talk about how to do research properly and handle research properly in the Christian world. Yeah, and like the kinds of questions that you should ask as you're reading other people talking about research. Exactly. Now, before we get to that, a couple of shout outs that I just want to do. First of all, you can help support this podcast by buying Nick's bras. We all need bras. And Nick's is amazing. I mean, we have a lot of male viewers. Uh, They don't necessarily (laughs) need bras. Um, But, you know, we all know someone who needs bras. And hopefully for who it wouldn't be creepy to buy a bra. Like, anyway, Nick's bras are great. I used to to buy, like, all the underwear, underwire, underwear, underwire bras. We're doing great. We're doing great. We're doing great. This is an awesome ad for Nick's. If you'd like to sponsor the podcast, you can get an ad like this for your company. (laughs) No, but, like, I I used to get all of those underwire bras, and they were never comfortable and you'd lift your arms up and then the underwear would go in very bad places and it was just not good and nyx is just all about comfort and Mm -hmm. they've got this really cool technology it bends in all kinds of different ways i don't even understand what it does no no but it supports you in all kinds of cool ways and uh, i really they've they've been life-changing for me the thing that i love about them is that they, they, like you said, they're all about comfort, but they don't sacrifice looking like a woman. Like they mm-hmm. don't, they, it's not like a, a schlumpy bra. Yes. You know, cause mm-hmm. we all have bras that are just for comfort. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they make you feel a little bit like a potato, right? Yes. <laughs> so, but these, <laughs> but the, the cool thing is it doesn't, sac- like you can feel womanly, feel beautiful, feel, insp- feel like, you know, empowered, whatever, all that stuff, mm-hmm. but it's still a really actually functional bra and, uh. I I think it's just interesting. I've said this before, looking at the trends with lingerie. I love Mm -hmm. that there's kind of this current trend where it's like, let's just not have to dress up the female body Mm -hmm. for it to feel beautiful. Exactly. So you can get the links. If you use our links, either nix.ca or nix.com in the US, then you you help support this podcast. So thank you for doing that. Also, since the the two of you are here today, Mm -hmm. our patron... How do you even say that? Patreon? It's okay. I think I finally figured. So it's Patreon is like the website. And then the people who sign up are patrons. Oh, cool. Okay. So you can join our Patreon. So, yes. Yes. The money for that goes to support. Pretty much, like, at this point, it's just whatever projects we have going on that are not monetizable, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, Joanna working on the peer-reviewed research papers that we have going on. You know, uh, I'm working on starting a bunch of new stuff over the next couple of years with some kind of deep delve uh, content that we're starting to write up. We want to mm-hmm. do some podcast series that are going to take a lot of time and yeah. we need some funding. And so we're yes. kind of saving a bit from the Patreon every month to uh, fund that kind of thing. Yeah, so. and it also it also funds uh, Stata, the, yes. the the program that Joanna yes. uses to run all our stats. I have a deep and profound love affair with Stata. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's been great because sometimes there are questions about stats. And if, I'm have, if I have two minutes, I can often answer a question quickly mm-hmm. um, because I have the right program and I can just write the code. Yes. yes. It's yes. a lot it's a lot better. Yeah. So all of our research expenses, we're also going to have this podcast, the Bear Marriage podcast is about to be um, transcripted, transcribed. Yes. This one might even be. We'll see. I, yeah. I'm not sure what the first one is. It's going to start, but the Patreon is uh, supporting that as well mm-hmm. to make sure that we can make this more accessible for both those who have littles and don't have time to listen and mm-hmm. those who are hearing impaired. Yes. So yeah. So that, so we will put the link to that. And we also have an amazing Facebook group that, yeah, that so goes fun. along with it. I think half of my posts come from our Facebook group at this point. Like yeah. I get ideas for posts from our Facebook group. And so it's just a wonderful place. And there's unfiltered podcasts, so you can check that out. But today, here we go. Research. 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 We're going to talk about this on a number of different podcasts. Today, what I want to look at 
is how research handles gender. I find that there's several different mistakes that people can use in the evangelical world that we've seen with other research. Mm -hmm. And the first one is a doozy, and that's assuming there's a gender difference without measuring both genders. Yes. So in other words, if one <laughs> were to ask 400 men, do you prefer to be alone and unloved or inadequate and disrespected? And those men, 74% choose alone and unloved to then declare that men need respect and women need love. When you haven't <laughs> asked women. <laughs> yes. There are many, many other issues with that question, which we will talk about on another podcast. But can, yes. Can I just say one thing? The other thing about this that just drives me nuts the statistics that you can run when you're comparing two groups and how they differ on a particular response, it's real fun. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's a lot of opportunity there. And they just said, nah. <laughs> like, I'm like, why wouldn't you do it? The mm -hmm. T-test? Come on! Just for the T-test! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's, like, literally no reason why. Anyway, it's, it's, there's no yeah. reason to not ask women except if you're trying to promote a sexist mentality. Yep. Or so if you're again, scared of the responses. In love yeah, and respect, yeah. the basis for love and respect what he claims is the basis for his thesis that men need respect while women desire love is the Bible verse, mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 32, mm -hmm. which is taken out of con. Like, it's just one Bible verse. It's just proof texting. And this survey by Shanti Felden in For Women Only, mm -hmm. where she says in her very book, and we've talked about this before, that that question was flagged by the survey expert and the pilot study. And the thing that I will say is, like, she continuously talks about this survey expert who she hires, like, uh, like to, to pad mm -hmm. her research, but then she also admits that she just didn't, uh, like, listen to his advice. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you don't get to use someone as a, oh, look, we did this great research, but then also you didn't listen to the expert. Right. So they ask men, they don't ask women, <laughs> But they make this whole theology out of men need respect while women need love. So they assume they know what women want. Yeah. Well, this, well, the thing is, they just assume that women are diametrically opposed to men. So if men are yeah. one way, women must be the other way. Because mm -hmm. this whole mentality that we have about marriage being a hierarchy, marriage being about one person having power over the other and the other one obeying and submitting, mm -hmm. means that they must be opposing forces. You can never actually be equally yoked. You mm -hmm. can't ever actually share experience. Or else, you might not have a valid reason to have power over the other. Mm -hmm. Right? If we acknowledge that we might be able to have the same core desires, the same core experiences, the same emotions, the same driving forces. If we admit that we're actually more alike than we are separate, then, oh, there's no reason to maintain power. Mm -hmm. There's no rationale anymore for why men need to be above women. And so we have to present women and men as these not only different, but diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. So men answer A, women must want B. Right, but they never measure. And no. incidentally, on that question, when a number of researchers did measure it, because they found this so ridiculous as well, uh, they started asking some Harvard-educated women, yep. uh, of whom, interestingly, Shanti is as well. Yes. <laughs> but uh, And 75% of women chose respect, so even yep. more than men. And then when yep. they asked women as a whole, when they included other women, it went down to 68%. Yeah, so, so the more educated a woman is, the more likely she is to choose respect. Yes. And what they were, in essence, thinking is that, you know, if you're more, if you're more educated you tend to have been told your whole life you can do anything the mm -hmm. way that men are told you can do anything yeah even in uneducated circles mm -hmm. right and so in essence like educated women are given the same uh, the same like pep talks that all men regardless of education are given in these kinds of circles so it's it's not about whether or not you have a penis or a vulva <laughs> it's about whether or not you were told hey you're competent and capable Mm -hmm. We're assuming gender differences where there are, are where there aren't one, and the way that we see this as well, which is also Shanti, and we're not trying to beat up on Shanti, by the way, like particularly, it's just that she's inserted herself into this conversation as the researcher, and so everyone's research is based on her surveys. Yes. Like, Shanti has made this her thing. She is the pillar of evangelical research, and she's mm -hmm. just done it in incredibly damaging and sexist ways. But for instance, she wrote two books for young men only and for young women only, okay? Mm -hmm. 
She did surveys for each of them where she asked the opposite sex. So for young women only, she asked young boys. And for young men only, she asked young women. There was a question that was in the survey to, girl, to boys that was not in the survey to girls. Mm -hmm. The question was, do you want to marry a virgin someday? So she asked the boys if they want to marry a virgin. She didn't ask the girls if they want to marry a virgin. So what does that tell us? When she's writing her books to young women, she makes sure to warn the girls that boys, even if they want to have sex, want to make sure that they marry a virgin. So make sure that you keep your purity. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't write in the book to boys that girls want to marry a virgin. Because why? Well, because we don't actually think that it's that important if a boy stays a virgin right. in the same way. And we say it, but mm -hmm. really what we're saying is girls' bodies and girls' worth is intrinsically tied up in what they can do sexually for a man in a way that boys' worth is not tied up with how they can sexually please a woman. And you know how we know that? The orgasm rate. <laughs> I'm going to say this, okay? The reason that... We in evangelicalism have an orgasm rate of, what was exactly the number? I keep on saying it wrong. It's 48%. The 48% orgasm rate that we found in our study of 20,000 women comes back to just even as basic as Shanti thinking it's appropriate to ask boys if they want to marry a virgin and not ask girls mm -hmm. because boys are not seen as their job being to sexually satisfy their spouse. Girls' job is to sexually satisfy a man. Yeah. Which is why men have orgasms and women don't. Yes. Another interesting one, and we've talked about this on a previous podcast, looking at how she told girls that 82% of boys oh, yeah. um, <laughs> have little ability or little or feel little responsibility to stop in a makeout situation. Again, that the way that she worded her, her question was really problematic. I don't think we're going to deal with too much of the wording of questions no, in this no, no. series on research. But what she was claiming is that boys would have a lot of difficulty stopping. We couldn't find an equivalent question in her survey for girls. No, Joanna and I both looked. Mm -hmm. But we did, like, not exactly, but we did find a question where it asked, like, how far do you think other girls will go? Or something like that. And But there was nothing about the girl who was the test taker. Her being a sexual being. Yeah. It was like the girls in your class, if they were in a makeup situation, how do you think they would be feeling? Like they would want to stop, they'd want to go further, they'd mm -hmm. want to be going all the way, That those kinds of questions. But it wasn't about you, the test taker, because again, girls are not seen as inherently sexual. Right. One thing that we really tried to do, Joanna, in our men survey, was mm -hmm. ask the exact same questions with the exact same wording. Yep. We added some. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we really wanted to understand men's lived experience of lust. Because we know that's something that's really, really pushed on guys in a way that it mm -hmm. isn't with women. But other than that, we asked the same questions mm -hmm. as much as was humanly possible. So that's just what you do. The other thing, again, is that unlocks a whole bunch of statistical opportunities to you. So there's no reason not to if you can ask the same question. Because then you can compare the results of men versus women. Yeah, because if, even if you word it differently, you can't compare the results because no. they might be responding. So, like, for instance, we asked in the t 1 to 20,000, like, how satisfied are you with, like, how much foreplay your husband mm -hmm. does, right? And then in the men's one, we would literally only change the words needed to make it about the husband. Like, how satisfied is your wife with the amount of foreplay you perform? Yeah. Like, yeah. It, <laughs> yes. it, was, it was literally word for word except for just the pronouns and uh, yep. the gender uh, yep. to make it clear who we were talking about. Yeah. And a lot of times with those ones, not with foreplay in particular, no. but with orgasm rates, we asked about how much do you, the husband, orgasm? How much does your wife orgasm? We did a lot of that as yeah. well. Right. So that's that's number one, is they assume gender differences without actually measuring them. Okay. Okay. Number two, what a lot of times we see in evangelical circles, the way they handle research, is that when there is a gender difference, mm -hmm. they chalk it up to this is the way God made it. Yep. And so, therefore, this is this is right and this is good. One area that I see this a lot is in the neuroscience research, and I'm not going to go too much into this because I know Connor and I already did a whole podcast on it. So if you're interested in hearing about how evangelicalism really screws up neuroscience, we'll link mm -hmm. that podcast. But what I've seen people do, for instance, is they'll find these studies that find that brain scans of, for instance, the amygdala are different. Like amygdala um, activation is different in men versus women when they look at uh, some, I forget what exactly it is, but some... It's the emotion center of the brain, like the, the fight or flight kind of part. And it lights up differently based on some sort of social interaction. So they say, oh, well, then men are just more fighters. They're more quick to the go. And women are more uh, laid back. And so they're more nurturing. 
He's like, mm-hmm. okay, but that same paper later on says, yeah, we're not sure why. <laughs> uh, we're, is this, could be an, this be an evolutionary advantage? Could this be a socialized thing? Because we also know that even within individuals of the same family, we can have different amygdala um, overrepresentation based on who was abused and who wasn't. Um, like, mm-hmm. there's a lot of different things that can make that happen. Mm-hmm. And evangelicals are like, oh, it fits the gender. Yes, it fits. It means that the men are the strong and the women are the caring. Yes. And then we just run with it. We don't actually ask the questions of, but why? Is it because God ordained it? Or is it because we are in a world where men have been socialized to be more trigger happy in terms of their emotions and women have been more socialized to step back and consider how we affect others? Is it that men are less likely to be victimized if they show strong emotions and women are more likely to be uh, victimized if they speak up? Is it like, what are all the things that could be going on here? Is it God ordained or is it a result of the fall? Right. Because, because when people say it's God ordained, for instance, the whole idea that men are more stoic and yes. less emotional. Yes. That's actually not healthy. No. <laughs> it is it is healthy to be to have emotional maturity and emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. And multiple studies have found that this is an area where women tend to excel. Now, th- part of the reason is because you need to get more emotionally intelligent when you have less power because you have to be able to read the people with more like this is kind mm-hmm. of conditioned into us. But it isn't healthy yes. to not have emotions and yet In the church, we often take that to mean this is the way God made men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or we see the things where it's like, you know, women tend to be the ones who stay home with the kids and men tend to work. And we say, oh, well, then men have a desire for work and a need for work in a way that men and women don't. We see this love and respect. Emerson Egrich says, like, there's this bizarre story of, like, men who, when they were tired, said, I I wish I were dead versus not working. Yes. And it was like, this is how men are. <laughs> men work. Men. Yes, work. That's not healthy. I'm like, ew. I would, you'd rather be at the office or dead than retired and hanging out with your wife? Like, oh my gosh, dude. Anyway, but like that's, that's a whole other thing, right? We, we see this thing where men tend to be very work oriented and that's apparently a good thing. It's like, mm-hmm. what if it's just... That that's how we've been socialized, or what if it's mm-hmm. that women tend to be more family oriented? Because hey, newsflash, I'm the one who nurses. Yeah. Even mm-hmm. if Connor wanted to be a stay at home dad, and I was out at the mm-hmm. office, I'd have to pump and yep. like sort all that out. I'm not doing that. I'm just gonna stay home and nurse, and he's gonna go out because mm-hmm. he's not the one who has his body constantly ravaged by childbirth and breastfeeding. Yep. <laughs> I know. Again, some people find it empowering. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have one like that that makes me laugh a lot. So originally, researchers thought that women as the ones who bear children, have a life hack where when our children cry, yes. our... I love this one. <laughs> our amygdalas go, whoa, yes. baby crying. And then we get up and we go and nurse our babies. Um, and there was actually a lot of concern about what would happen when gay men had babies to look after on their own without a woman there because how on earth were they going to get up in the middle of the night? Because think of the amygdala. Yeah. It turns out it's just if you're really attached to your kid, your amygdala will light up. Or there's one parent whose amygdala will of uh, however many parents there are. And in in my marriage, I must admit, I am not the one with the the amygdala that lights up. I had too many cases of mastitis. (laughs) And too much blood loss and so I was just asleep and dead to the world and my husband would get up with the babies and so he is the one who goes honey you gotta go she's been up for 10 minutes you slept through it (laughs) this is every night friends every night so yeah so yes obviously most of the time women have breasts we are nursing we are the one who gets up with the babies therefore it is the woman whose amygdala lights up uh, that is not a biological certainty. No. Um, and it, it may be what happens the most often for very obvious and understandable reasons. But that doesn't mean that it's the only way that it is. Yeah, and it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that men get a pass and they don't hear the baby in mm-hmm. the same yeah. way. Like if you're uh, in a situation where like you're there and you're the mom and you're like struggling 
and you're like, he just doesn't hear the baby, and I'm constantly having to, like, I'm constantly up, and he just doesn't get up, and and, it, and then people say, well, that's just how the brains work, sweetie. No, it's actually not. It's like you can both <laughs> figure out a way to make it work, whether it's like, I mean, for, for me too, it's actually Connor. In our family, it's the same way too, because I need to sleep because of how exhausted I was after my C-section, mm -hmm. right? But I can't imagine what it would have been like if Connor just, like relied on all this like science that shows that quote unquote men don't respond because of their brains right it's like no it's just that because of what happens our brains tend to end up working this way and that's when we put the cart before the horse when mm -hmm. we look at these studies mm -hmm. what we see is well women's brains tend to do this and so men's brains must not because of how we're made but what it really is is we live in an environment that more likely means that women's brains will end up doing this. But what happens if we change the environment? What mm -hmm. happens if we end up married to men like me and Joanna who are really attuned to their wife's needs and mm -hmm. who really take ownership of parenting? Mm -hmm. Well, then all of a sudden, women get to sleep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? And isn't that a better picture of what it means to love your bride like Christ loves the church versus saying, mm -hmm. well, that's how God made me. You should really get in line with how God made us yeah. and just do your God-given role. Yeah. Okay, so now I have a question for both of you. Okay. okay. How tall are you and how tall is your husband? I am 5'5 five, five and Keith is, what is he? Is he 5'9? 5'9. Five, 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 nine. Okay, so there's a four inch difference. Uh -huh. I am 165 centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> you're 5'4 because you're, you're five, four, cause you're I'm just five, a little four. bit. Okay, he's a short you. one and Katie's a tall one. I just know mine in centimeters. Yeah, 5'4, five, 5'5, five, 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 six. That's right, okay, Katie. I'm 5'4 <laughs> and Connor is 5'11. Okay, so we have seven inches. Yeah. And then I am five foot one and my husband is six foot two so there's quite the height difference there's 13 okay so each of us has a different difference mm -hmm. in yes. how tall we are versus our husbands and of course some women are very tall and some men are quite short and so sometimes you actually see uh, I had friends uh who he was uh, probably five seven and she was about five eleven yeah, my great grandmother was was i think five eleven and my great grandfather was five six yeah it's yeah. awesome yeah. so <laughs> but we say that men are taller than women mm -hmm. because of course on average mm -hmm. men are a couple inches taller than women and when we're looking at aggregate data that's what we find that's called the comparing the two means, right, of the populations. But when we look at an actual couple and what is the difference in height between the two individuals in the couple, they, that varies a lot. And so when we're talking about differences between groups of people, we have to remember that we're comparing the difference in means or medians, depending on what stats you're running. And that's very different than the actual distribution within the group and the difference between those two people. That applies to height. It also applies to things like personality mm -hmm. um, measures, like how outgoing people are, how conscientious they are. It also can apply to things like how ambitious two different people are mm -hmm. or uh, how much emphasis they put on working or their libido mm -hmm. can vary a lot. And so when we're writing books and we assume men have a higher libido than women, mm -hmm. A, that may or may not be true because we're looking at individuals and not at populations. You aren't writing a book to men, <laughs> the yes. average man. You're writing a book to a bunch of couples who are going to vary. But then the other thing, of course, is that things like libido can vary within the lifespan as well, as Rebecca and I have been pregnant and nursing for years. That <laughs> has profound effects. Yes, uh, yes. Right? And, and men's bodies don't go through those changes in the same way. I think, yeah, I think we understand distribution when it comes to intelligence a little bit more. Not not comparing two groups. I'm not going to compare men's women's talent. That's what I'm no, talking no, no, about. No. But we understand that like 100 is average. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like 100 is average. And then, you know, between 80 and 120 is like normal. <laughs> normal. And then you have the people that are on either ends. Yeah. Yeah. And you have very few people on either end. So you get, it gets, you get this nice little bell curve. It looks like a bell. And it gets really a lot smaller the yeah. further out from the mean that you get. And we understand that when it comes to intelligence. But picture that kind of a graph for whatever it is that you're talking about. For all sorts about. of things. For like how, yeah, how detail-oriented you are. How much you like dogs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some people who really like dogs. <laughs> Some people who really don't like dogs. The majority of people are like, yeah, dogs are good. <laughs> but again, if we assume that um, these differences are absolute, mm -hmm. then we also can tend to assume that's the way God made them, as yeah. opposed to understanding it could be that, be that there's a difference because of a cultural factor. And that's mm -hmm. one thing that we found when you ran that on... Um, how the every man's battle idea affects mm. women's libido. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it lowers it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so, and that's our thesis for the Great Sex Rescue is that there are a lot of teachings that are out there in the water that are artificially lowering women's libido, add mental load to it, which is also artificially lowering women's libido. And is it really that men have a, high, a, a drastically higher libido or is it that we have artificially lowered women's yeah, libido? Or is it that we have created a world in which men get to enjoy sex because mm-hmm. women take on all the burden? Mm-hmm. of the emotional labor that goes into just general living, yeah. including it's, the emotional labor of their own husband's sexual sin. Yeah, and so what would happen if we lifted all that? I kind of see that as my goal in life. Yeah. Like one of the <laughs> things is like, let's lift all the things that artificially decrease women's libido yeah, and exactly. see what happens. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be amazing? Okay, last yeah. point. But that goes into our last point because here's, here's the last thing that we tend, well, it's not the last thing, but here's the last thing that we're going to talk about today that researchers tend to do about gender Mm -hmm. um, that leads us to commit a fallacy, okay? We've talked about how we have these two averages, Mm -hmm. but what they often do is they then define the female's response based on the male's response. So we take what men do and see that as normal, Mm -hmm. right? So that is our standard. What men experience is standard. And Joanna was talking about this. Yeah, so I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Take yourself back to high school biology. On the wall, there is a poster. And the poster says, the anatomy of the human body. And it's a dude. Yup. <laughs> it's always a dude. It's always a dude. <laughs> there is actually no such thing as a human body. There's yeah. a male body and a female body in terms of anatomy. Yep. But there is not actually a human amorphous blob. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> they always go for the man as the default. Yeah, and that's exactly, and, and we, we do this all the time. Mm-hmm. And what we what that means is, you know, we see that, for instance, let's take the libido again, okay? Okay. Again, I'm sorry to go back at her, but she has put herself in this position of being the researcher. Shanti Felden, in her book for women only, asked men whether or not they wanted sex more often than their wives. And, and then asked them all these questions about like, why do you want sex? All these things, right? Perfectly fine. Um, then tells the women that sex is really important to your husband. You probably don't want it as much as he does based on these responses. And so make sure that like you're making this priority, blah, blah, blah. And she says a lot of very problematic things in there. Um, but what she said is men replied, I want sex more than my wife on average. And so she told women, your husband probably wants more sex than you do. So make sure you're making a priority. Right. So let's look at what she says in the book to men. Mm-hmm. So in the book to men, she, she um, surveyed women. And what Point she found... That was that the majority of her sample reported having higher or the same libido as their husbands. Right. The majority of women in her sample, the majority, I want to emphasize, this was the majority, as in more than 50%, Mm -hmm. reported either having the same or a higher libido than their husbands. Mm -hmm. And so what would you logically think she would say to the men? Logically, if she were being an honest researcher, if she were to apply the same standards, she would have written a book saying, hey, men, women really like sex. (laughs) You know, your wife wants to have sex with you. She enjoys your sex life. And so like, you know, if you're in the, like if you're, if your wife, uh, you know, like it it, it would have been assuming that same or higher is normal, right? That's not what she does. What she does is she omits all of those women Mm -hmm. from her analysis and she doesn't really talk about them in her book and she puts a note there that says because our survey of men found that most men want more sex than their wives and we weren't able to double check with these women's husbands we're not going to Mm -hmm. you know address these women and just focus on the minority since that's the more felt need among men Oh, it makes me so uncomfortable as a researcher. It's so bad oh. because she didn't do that for the for the book to women. Right. She didn't write a book to the minority of women who had the higher sex drive mm-hmm. based on what the women had said in their survey to men. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, or based on anything. Like, she literally says, so both men and women report having either the same or a higher sex drive on average. So maybe we just write about how there's a communication problem. Or right. how, hey, so if you have a lower libido, let's figure out how we can boost it. Because, hey, this is the majority of people's experiences. Yeah. Instead, it's these women, the majority of my female respondents must be wrong because they don't line up with what the men say. Yeah. That is horrifically offensive. Mm -hmm. And misogynist. It's misogynistic and horrifically offensive and just very bad faith research. 
Yeah. It just is bad faith research. But we do. We take this male perspective as the standard. Yeah. And then women have to have to live up to it. And so basically, a lot of the time that we talk about gender in the Christian world, we are misunderstanding women. And so with that in mind, I would like to bring a guest on to the podcast to talk about her new book, The Most Misunderstood Women of the Bible. <laughs> Well, I am excited to bring to you today, Mary DeMuth. This is our second time meeting sort of in person. We met in person, what, a decade ago, maybe? I think so, but we can't remember where. No, <laughs> but I think it happened. I, I know it happened. But Mary and I go go way back on Twitter. Like we talk on yes. Twitter all the time. I have really admired Mary. I've been watching you over the years. You are such a strong advocate for sexual abuse survivors and for calling out the powers that be about that. And even I, I seen you speaking up so much about plagiarism in the Christian world. And I mm-hmm. really, I really appreciate your integrity and your fighting for those who need it. And yeah, I've just admired you for a long time. So I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. And I still can't believe that there are people out there, Christians who believe plagiarism is no big deal. It is a big deal and it's called stealing. So hello. Yes. Yes. I know you understand. Yes. (laughs) Sadly. Yes, I do. So you are here because you have a new book, which I love called um, the most misunderstood women in the Bible. Is that the right title? I just read it. Okay. That's right. Yes. I had this brain thing. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get this title. Okay. <laughs> What's that book again? <laughs> so what you did, and I love it. You took um, a number of women's stories that have all been misunderstood. Like when we tell their stories, we miss the main part of it. And we portray them in such a negative light. And you fictionalize it. I mean, you don't fictionalize it, but you, but you tell the story in a fictional way. And mm-hmm. then you talk about what the Bible says and what lessons we can learn from each woman. And you take, I mean, obviously you don't take every woman in the Bible because that would be too many, but you, t- yes. <laughs> I, I th- you took a big breadth of women who have been misunderstood for different reasons. So they haven't all been misunderstood for the same reason. And I really appreciate that. And I pulled out a couple I thought we could talk about. Awesome. Let's do it. So I thought we could start with Hagar because she is one of my favorite women in the Bible and she's so often forgotten. Mm -hmm. Can you give me your take on Hagar? You know, she has a lot of moxie and verve (laughs) and joie de vivre, as they say in the French language. Um, She is in this um, slavery situation, most likely came from Egypt. And she has this like opposite, um, she came from Egypt into slavery instead of the opposite. So she kind of has this wonderful parallels of um, kind of the Israel story, but in reverse. I, I, I tried to help the reader understand what that would feel like to have someone say, here, go sleep with my husband. And what that must have, I mean, she had no say in it and how awkward and creepy and strange that would be. And that Abraham was just like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. And so then he did it. And, you know, it was definitely most likely against her will. I mean, she didn't get to have a will. So it's hard to say it was against Mm -hmm. her will because she never got to exercise her will, but none of us really think about Mm -hmm. it that way. And so that's why I loved exploring her story because you get these, all these firsts with her. She's the first to really emote in the Bible. Like she's the first that really has these strong emotions. She's the first to, obviously we know that she's the first to name God. She's, I think the only one to name God. And she's, um, has two divine encounters that are profound Mm. and she gets, you know, her son is given these promises of 12 children as well. I mean, it's just like God took notice of her, even though she was kind of definitely put to the side. You know, I had known that about Hagar. I've used that line so often that Hagar was the first one to give the name to God. And I love the name she gives, you know, the God who sees me, Elroy. I hadn't realized she was the first to be visited by an angel. Yes. Yes. That's amazing. I know. Like she's got all these firsts and she also, um, her son means God hears. And so you see this like beautiful juxtaposition of the God Elroy, um, the God who sees, and then you have 
her son Ishmael, which means God hears us. And Mm -hmm. so how powerful is that, that I think many women today feel like they're unseen or they're unheard, especially those in abusive situations. And so she is kind of the patron saint of that. And I've seen a lot of like um, scholarship in the African-American community, that Hagar's a big, big deal in that community. And I'm really grateful that there's a lot more written about her from their perspective than from our white perspective, which I so appreciate. How has she been misunderstood? Do you think? I think it's more like she's been just kind of placated to the sidelines and dismissed. Like the real story is that Sarah eventually had a baby and that it became the nation of Israel. And, and so she's just kind of not noticed, but God makes it very clear that she is seen and heard. And so I don't know why we gloss over it, but it's a huge story. And it's like he interrupts the narrative and just says, wait a minute, (laughs) there is a woman who's in desperation and I'm going to visit her. It has these echoes of the woman at the well where Jesus has this great interaction with her. Um, And we see, you know, as we catapult to the uh, the New Testament, that's the longest theological discourse Jesus has with any living human being is with the woman at the well. And so we just see this echoing and repetition of God really caring about marginalized women. And so that's why I love talking about her story. Yeah. And it's so interesting because Hagar is the first one who gets to name God, you know, the God who sees me, but then the woman at the well is the first one that Jesus explicitly says, I am the Messiah. So the the first one that Jesus reveals his name to, I just think that's so cool too. (laughs) I agree. I just think that's amazing. And I love reading the Bible because especially when I read it truncated, like I've been reading it in 60 or 90 day increments, like the whole Bible. And it's been so glorious because I get to make all these connections, which you wouldn't do if you're just kind of going slowly. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of my spiritual practices that I encourage believers to do is to read the Bible quickly because you will have so much more connection between that old Testament and new Testament stories. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Another woman. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the sex ones, but it's, (laughs) they're not all misunderstood because of sexual assault or sexual assault survivors. They're misunderstood for different reasons. Like I love what you said about Naomi and yeah. So, so it's not all about sex, but I do want to talk about Bathsheba. (laughs) Of course it makes sense because there's been quite a debate in the Twitter spaces that we're in and just in the, in the wider evangelical conversation as a whole as to whether Bathsheba was a seductress or whether she was an assault victim. Yeah. I'm so over it. And I I know me too. (laughs) Like, come on now people. Well, especially I've had a couple of instances that I think helped me in this. First of all, um, we, my husband and I had the privilege of going to Israel and you could see that in the city of David, like his castle would have been above everybody else's. And Typically, if he was going off to war, which is what he should have been doing, he would never have seen her. And then also just knowing and learning about mikvahs and that that was, you know, where you would wash yourself when you were ceremonially unclean, like if you were having your period, which is why they knew that she, he was the father of her child because she had just had her period. And that's not a sensual bath. Um, And it's not like, she's like, Oh, I'm sure the King's watching. She was not that way. Plus it says the other thing that I speculated on, and I can't prove this, I'll find out on the other side in heaven, but there's no mention of her having children with Uriah because it doesn't say that she brought her children with her to the palace. It didn't say that, you know, that there were the, as any other offspring of hers. And so wouldn't it be interesting to think about her as being um, unable to have children? And then the one time she's able to have children, it's through this rape and then her baby dies. And then you begin to see her as just so much more multidimensional and so much more violated. Um, She could not say no to a king. None of us could in that particular society. There was just no And even if she screamed, which the Old Testament gave provision for that, if there was, you know, no one around and a rape happened, um, you know, a woman at that point was expected to scream, but no one could have heard her if she was in the wilderness. And so then they would err on the side of the woman. Um, And so, but even if she screamed, she was in the palace, he was surrounded by his own people. And the very people who would have taken him to account 
were people like Uriah he would have pushed back because they were in that kind of relationship. So he had isolated himself, taken him away from any accountability. And of course we have Nathan, the prophet who comes eventually and says, you are the man, but you know, it's a power struggle of a King taking advantage of his lusts. And that's as simple as it is. I cannot see it any different way. No. And I remember growing up that I was taught that she seduced him. Yeah that she seduced him. And yet the bath that she was taking, like you said, it wasn't um, sensual and no one else would have been able to see her. Like, right. Yeah. So it it really couldn't have been that. And when soldiers come to get you, (laughs) which is what the Bible said happened, what is she supposed to do? I think that's one of the things I want to encourage readers to do is just simply have a plain reading of the text. We've had so much political stuff thrown out the text even just this year, I got a book that was, um, someone asked me to endorse and they said that she was a part of an adulterous affair. And even from a pulpit recently, I heard, oh, you know, David, he committed adultery. And I'm like, my husband's next to me and he's like bristling with me. We're like, oh, it's not adultery. It's called rape. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It was just so frustrating. I it's hap- So you heard it way back when I'm still hearing it now. I think we're still yeah. hearing it that she was some sort of seductress and David had this adulterous affair. It's not an affair if you can't say no. Exactly. <laughs> if you yeah, have no a, say in it, it's, 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 um, it's not an affair. Yeah. It's a, when there's, when there's major power imbalances, when there's no consent, then it is sexual assault <laughs> and mm-hmm. we need to start seeing that. And that applies I see this so often in youth groups too, when the youth pastor quote unquote has an affair (laughs) with a member of the youth group. And I've seen that way too many times in my personal life. It's like, no, (laughs) that is abuse. That is clergy sex abuse. And we need to start naming it for what it is. I hope that one day that narrative changes about Bathsheba. Okay. Another one I want to talk about this, we're going to get away from sex a little bit here, (laughs) but Phoebe, I love Phoebe. (laughs) I do Most too. People and she, don't even know who she is. They don't, they don't know who she is. Yeah. Um, having watched so many episodes of friends in my mind, she's always Phoebes, but um, mm-hmm. <laughs> she's, she's got some moxie. And the reason I wrote about her was I was contracted with guideposts to write a biblical fiction about her. And so I'd, I had already done all the research that I could on her. And so I thought, well, I'll just use my research again, because she's so fascinating And there's such a strong, strong possibility. And many scholars believe that there's a strong possibility that she was the one that brought the book of Romans to Rome. Now think about that. If she had not done that, we would not have the book of Romans, which is in and of itself, the most profoundly theologically astute book in the new Testament, an echo of the book of Exodus, almost, you know, in a beautiful parallel. And it's just crazy to me um, Mm. that we just don't even we just gloss over the fact that Paul commends her and most likely means she's the one that brought it there. Yeah. And she was a deacon. Mm -hmm. She was used the same word for her. It's often translated servant, Mm -hmm. but the Greek word is exactly the same. It's the same word. Yeah. (laughs) It's the same. Yeah. Yeah. And that's lovely. I I've also heard some um, theories that she wrote Hebrews. No one. Yes. I've heard that too. Yeah. 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 Because the right of the Hebrews is is not known, and mm-hmm. it's often been thought that the reason it's not known is because it was a woman. Yeah. Um, and different, whether it's Priscilla or Phoebe. Priscilla, or, yeah, I've heard Priscilla. I haven't heard Phoebe, but that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I find that fascinating too. Um. So one of the big theses that you make at the beginning of the book, and this is something that I needed to chew on a little bit myself. So this was very good for me, is that being misunderstood just seems to be such a common thing throughout scripture, but it was also something that Jesus dealt with to such a huge extent. And his way of, of handling that was not to try to correct everybody else's impression of him. It was just to go do his work. Yeah. That's hard, Mary. Do I really (laughs) have to think that? (laughs) Well, 
Well, I mean, you can, we have to take the whole counsel of scripture and the whole mm -hmm. um, gospel narratives. There are times when he corrects people and says, you have a wrong impression of me. So it's not that we never do that, but that we go to the Holy Spirit and say, when should I speak and when should I not speak? And we do see Jesus in front of, you know, the Sanhedrin, not saying a word, but eventually when he's forced to, he does. Um, and so, and to his closest companions, he is much more open um, than he is with the crowd. The, he speaks in parables with the crowd and the crowd doesn't understand him. But a lot of times, you know, it's easy for us to say, well, those Pharisees, they were weird and they didn't understand him. But a lot of times it was his disciples that they were like, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> they just did not understand you know, destroy this temple. And three days later, they don't know what was going on. And it's really um, a fun exercise to read through the gospels as if you didn't know what was going to happen next mm -hmm. and to try to empathize with the disciples. They didn't know that the cross was coming. Um, you know, when John three sixteen was said, yes. they didn't know what that meant, but he said it before it even happened. Um, and so it's just interesting, you know, they didn't understand resurrection. I mean, they'd seen it with Lazarus and a couple other people, but they had, it just, they just didn't get it. And so many times, especially when I'm reading through the gospels, so many times they're like, even just today, yesterday, I read the book of beginning the book of acts. And they were like, is this now the time you're going to restore the kingdom? He's like, it's not, you don't get to know. And, and I, I kind of just feel humor underneath that. It's like, you just still don't get it. Yeah. It's not about a warfare of a nation building. It is about a kingdom that cannot be moved. It's about an upside down kingdom that has nothing to do with political power. Yeah. I love that. I know it's so interesting when you read the gospels to read about how Jesus is announcing the kingdom of God and Jesus, and it's not about I'm dying for your sins. It's about so much more than that. And yet we have condensed it to something that Jesus didn't actually talk about all that much. Mm -mm. And not to say that isn't true, but it, it, it's like, it's like, we've just made it too small. Yeah. I mean, you see this whole rebuilding of a new kingdom and we are his kingdom workers and we are to go out into the whole world and be bits and pieces of light in a dark, dark world. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, that, that involves a whole, that involves flourishing all over the place. So yeah. how can we be agents of flourishing in this dark world? And I think that's really what, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's what your book is trying to help women see is that even if you're misunderstood, you can be an agent of flourishing because God doesn't misunderstand you. And if you keep mm -hmm. running after, you know, what he has for you, rather than getting bogged down in just how unfair everything is. <laughs> well, and just, it's an apologetic to me because mm -hmm. I feel like there was a I wrote this book because of a misunderstanding with a friend a couple of years ago. And I felt like, I mean, I, I feel like I wasted so much of my head space for a couple years where it was circulating in my mind. What could I have done differently? Why did that person do that? Why did I do this? Why are we this way? And it, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't untangle it because, you know, when you encounter someone who's maybe sociopathic or psychopathic, you never can really, you'll never understand them. And so you'll just kind of continually like circle, 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 circle reasoning, and you just can't figure it out. And it would, it'll drive you crazy. And so the point of the book is, yes, there's misunderstanding standing in this world. Yes, you need to grieve it, but you have to move on from it because otherwise, if you stay in that place, you'll never move forward. And the enemy will get two victories. He'll get the victory when you have that misunderstanding. And then it'll get a secondary victory in that you'll be so preoccupied with the pain that you won't move forward. Yeah. No, I love that. Which again, and you're not saying that you don't fight for justice because that's your whole life. Like I said, I'm yeah. <laughs> <your> whole life. <laughs> definitely my whole life. <laughs> yeah. But we, we need to keep, we need to keep the focus on what it is that God has called us to. Um, and I, I really, I really do appreciate that. Was there another woman that you wished you could have written about? Because I know you were limited. I, there's so many women. Was there? Yeah, I mean, definitely the woman caught in adultery, even though that that portion of scripture was added a little later. Um, and there's scholars that would say that doesn't belong. And, right. Um, I do think it's a beautiful story. And then um, because I've written about the woman at the well in another book, I felt like I couldn't 
tackle her again, but if I were able to, um, she would definitely be one. Um, and then Mary, mother of Jesus heavens and Mary of Bethany, goodness, that woman, she was awesome. So there's so many others. Um, those were new Testament ones, Deborah from the old Testament. Um, there's just so many different Sarah would be an interesting one to tackle. So maybe yeah, I've be never a, liked Sarah and I know, I think, I'm kind of mad at her. So I'd like to write about her so I can have more empathy. <laughs> yeah. You know who I do love that Harley ever talks was Vashti. I think Vashti yeah. is awesome. Yeah. That would have been a good one too. You know, so maybe there'll be a most misunderstood women of the Bible part. De. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do you think that women are more misunderstood and our, I guess just because we don't have an, as many, as, as, as loud a voice, is that what's happening? I think so. And I think the narrative for centuries upon centuries has been dominated by a male voice. Mm-hmm. So even if women are having a chance to finally say things like, Hey, Bathsheba didn't really have a voice in saying no to mm-hmm. King David, um, our voices are less and, um, they are dominated by a bigger narrative. And so, yeah, I think it's really important that we continue to, to stay with that justice issue and, um, to talk about that we are part of the Imago Dei, that God's very nature, his um, presence goes with us just as much as it does a man's. Mm -hmm. And we are not second class citizens. There is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, so slave or free. So we are all on this level playing field of the cross. But I am so sad that um, astute and profoundly wise women's voices are considered lesser or that people would only read theologians who resemble themselves. And that makes me sad. Yeah. I think a lot of women feel some pain when they read the Bible, just because of how the Bible has been misused. And I hope that in reading your book, the most misunderstood women of the Bible, it can help women see that we are part of the story, that we were always part of the story, Mm -hmm. even if that has somehow been ignored or pushed aside. I think it can be really healing. And and I hope that's what people get out of it. That's my prayer too. You know, that people would fall in love with the Bible and begin to read it, as I said before, plainly, Mm -hmm. um, and just, just read the text. I mean, look at Eve and, and she actually owns up to her sin. Adam does not, he blames God and her, but he does not say, you're right. I did it. And when we see the we see the leveling against someone it's against him throughout scripture. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting, whatever reason, the narrative has always been Eve's terrible. She started all this and she, he was there in the garden. He just wasn't saying anything. He was standing right next to her. And for whatever reason, people have not figured that out, but it's right there in the text. He's right there. He could have said, wait a minute, this is, you're telling us a bunch of lies and go away, yucky serpent. But he didn't, he was right there and he was mute. Yeah. I know. I, I, I always laugh because Emerson Eggerton in love and respect said that Adam wasn't there, that Eve had to go get him. And we, we took a look. Yeah, he did. And we took a look at all the baby Bibles. I had people send in pictures of their baby Bibles and I would say 85% had Eve standing alone. Oh Yeah. You know, so that's a big, that's a big problem. Well, Mary, I I feel like you have two hats when I see you on Twitter. I mean, one is just the profound heart for victims and justice. And the other is your profound love of the Bible. And you have this wonderful podcast, Pray Every Day. How many downloads does it have now? It's at 2.6 million, I think, last I checked. Yeah. So it's just a wonderful Mary. Just, it's a short thing. You can listen to every day and just pray. (laughs) And I, I love it. So do check out Mary, where else can they find you? They can find me at marydemuth.com. And then I'm also, um, I am painting through Lent right now. And so if you follow me on Instagram at, at Mary Demuth, you can see time lap- lapses of the paintings that I'm doing. And I'm doing all of like the characters and uh, the character and names of God. And so it's been a really fun thing to do every single day. Well, I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been fun to see you again it's after so however great. long it's been. <laughs> I know, right? We don't know, but I'm sure it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> 
I'm so glad Mary could join us for this podcast. Please check out her new book. I think it's wonderful. Uh, Thank you to Joanna and Rebecca who joined us at the beginning. And now as we go into the holiest weekend of the year, I just wish all my listeners peace, time to meditate on what the Easter season means. Tomorrow as we go into the dark Good Friday when we remember what Jesus did for us. And then Sunday, as we remember, he is risen. He is risen indeed. So we go through the whole gamut of emotions (laughs) over this next weekend. And may it be a special and blessed one for you and your family. And I will see you again next week. Bye-bye.